Technology has made the ability to connect easier than ever, but how can we use technology to increase health outcomes? Welcome to Advancing Health, a podcast brought to you by the American Hospital Association. I'm Tom Hederly, Senior Writer for AHA. In this podcast, Priya Bathesia, Vice President of the Value Initiative, discusses the ability to improve healthcare value and quality with the CEO and founder of Access Mobile, an international digital health company focused on mobile patient engagement. Hi, KP. Thanks for being with us today. We're excited to hear more about Access Mobile and what you are doing to improve value. So why don't we just get started? If you could tell us a little bit about your background and how that contributed to the start of Access Mobile. Great. Thanks so much, Priya. I really uh, appreciate the opportunity. So my name is uh, Kapama Yopala, and I go by KP for short, and people wonder where the name's from often. My family's from Ghana, so both my parents are Ghanaian, and I was born in the U.S., and I still have a lot of extended family in Ghana, and what I kind of saw with, you know, my family members, you know, in Ghana was some of the challenges they face around kind of just getting access to kind of reliable quality healthcare services, um, and how that kind of created some challenges for some of them with various conditions like diabetes or other things. So very, from a young age, I became very focused on how to think about issues of access and quality in terms of healthcare service delivery. And that kind of led me into a career in public health. And I was one of the early employees of what was called the Clinton HIV AIDS initiative years ago, but now it's called the Clinton Health Access Initiative. I'm working on those issues in East Africa as well as West Africa and Ghana. And so that was kind of where this kind of whole obsession with access to quality care started. And, and then it kind of took a twist into the digital domain. Got it. Got it. So can you explain a little bit about Access Mobile and what you're trying to do? So one of the things that I observed when I was working um, in different African countries, both in Ghana and then for several years in East Africa with the Clinton Initiative is that, you know, I realized that despite some of the challenges around access, everybody had a phone. And, you know, on the supply side, what was clear to me in a resource constrained setting was that I didn't really feel like you could train enough health workers fast enough or build enough hospitals fast enough to bridge the access to care gap. But because I saw everyone having a phone, you know, I I kind of thought, well, how can we leverage the mobile device and mobile connectivity to bridge that gap? Um, And that's why I founded Access Mobile in uh, late 2011. And we're on a mission to then improve access to to health information and services through what we call intelligent mobile engagement. And so at the beginning and kind of even where we are today, it's really been around text messaging and, and notifications. So really trying to personalize communication to people in a way that influences behavior and drives outcomes. And so our model is both a mix of expertise around behavioral science and generally thinking about behavior change to digital channels, and then also software, our platform AM Health, that automates communication in a HIPAA-compliant way. Very cool. And one of the stats we have in a video that we often show at AHA events is that more individuals have access to a phone than a toothbrush, which I always find quite amazing. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So you found a way to sort of capitalize on that. Um, But how how are patients actually engaging in this initiative? How have you been able to reach them in a way they may not have been reached before? Right. So with health reform in the U.S., um, there's a big focus on the patient portal, right? Mm -hmm. And most hospitals... Um, and health systems, you know, and private practices were really pushing portal adoption. And one of the issues with portal adoption is that one, data is not connected. So when it comes to thinking about people having different providers, oftentimes there's not a unified portal experience. 
portals typically haven't been designed to be mobile first and we live in a mobile first world. And then on top of that, a lot of populations that have some of the deepest needs around access and quality are not on the patient portal and they don't engage there. And so what we do is we kind of take advantage of the fact that we live in a notification driven world, whether it's through app notifications or texting to then enable tailored communication through HIPAA compliant messaging that supports um, an individual's care needs. So for example, in the care compliance space, a simple concept would be, you know, imagine a scenario where you have a diabetes patient who's in a certain state on Medicaid and who through informed consent is able to receive messages that are tailored to them to remind them to come to the doctor to get their medications and all of that. Um, and so at the end of the day, we kind of optimize the engagement experience through the channels that matter to people and where they can respond. And then also then drive the outcomes ultimately of getting people to be in that kind of appropriate care seeking behavior as an example. So at the executive forum, when we, when we chatted, you shared that you're working with a couple hospitals across the country to really use this solution. And one of the things you mentioned that I thought was interesting is that you are segmenting populations and developing solutions that would work better in one population that may not work in another population. So could you share a little bit about the work that you are doing with hospitals around the country? Yeah, I'm happy to. So I think just in terms of segmentation and personalization, the idea is that you know, and what we observe in the patient engagement space is that it kind of seems to operate in a sense of that everyone thinks all messages are the same. So I'll give a, an example, like someone might say, well, an appointment reminder is an appointment reminder. There's no rocket science there, right? You just send a text, remind people about an appointment and they come. But obviously we know when we look at things like social determinants of health and context, demographics, that people may respond to those messages very differently. Right. And so what we've been doing with our partners is really taking that highly tailored approach to looking at different population segments and then how to influence the behavior. So, for example, we work with Cascade Comprehensive Care in Oregon. It's a rural health care payer um, that's working with around 25,000 Medicaid lives. And the issues they have are, are that these populations typically have high disease burden, they're hard to reach, and they have some challenges around ensuring that those people get their care. And so what we've done with them is really taken a data-driven approach, working with their teams, analyzing their populations, and then, for example, sending information based on different demographics and disease states in terms of service availability, for example. So let's say that uh, we know that someone lives far away from a provider, but let's say that the payer has a transportation service, but that person doesn't know. Yeah. Um, one of the things we find is people don't respond to phone calls. And we think some of that is related to the issues of telephone spam. But if you actually send a text and someone knows who you are, you might be able to inform them that transportation service and they actually take that action to go to the provider, right? So it just is these little clever trips. It's, it's kind of, you know, it's a mix of some, let's say, high-end analytics with some low-tech approaches that can kind of get the result. Yeah, that's very cool. And I, I can attest to the fact that I, will, I am much more likely to respond to a text than I am to pick up the phone and talk to someone. So I think that is the way the world is moving for most individuals. When we talk about different solutions that promote value through the value initiative, we've been really focused on highlighting solutions that reduce cost, improve outcomes, and enhance the patient experience. Have you been able to measure how access mobile solutions create value for consumers? And if not, have you been able to anticipate how you may measure that in the future? Yeah. So like in terms of uh, 
patient experience, we definitely have anecdotal data. And we're, we're at this point with one of our clients, we're actually running a qualitative survey. So we will have some information soon through a kind of more rigorous kind of analytics approach. But even when, you know, when, when our clients, like let's say Adventist Health White Memorial sends messages to its population that are salient and that the population sees are relevant, there's a direct feedback loop. I mean, literally people actually will reply by text and say things such as thank you for caring about my health or thank you for this information related to my services, where you can see a very concrete set of kind of qualitative indicators that show you that the perception is that this is enhancing not just the engagement of the provider with the patient, but their perception of, of quality of care and, and it ultimately supports patient experience. So we have several examples of that where, I mean, we'll have people applying in different languages, Spanish or English, but saying those kind of things. We are also in the, when it comes to cost, with one of our rural partners, one of the issues they have is that they're supposed to send mailers out to their population with plan information, but they don't have valid addresses because people move a lot or, and so the mailers bounce. They lose a lot of money, but they're mandated to do this. So, you know, think about something as simple as doing text-based phone number or address validation through the phone where you can reach out to someone and before you ever send that mailer, get a valid address. In other words, you're then able to reduce the bounce cost and you can see like just direct cost optimization there. So those are some of the different types of examples. It looks, it looks different in different scenarios. We are doing another intervention with diabetes patients where we've worked with a leading clinician in that space in Los Angeles to basically do highly tailored messages based on different behavioral frames and language preferences for those diabetes patients. And the idea is, and this is done through informed consent and opt-in in the clinical setting, then these patients are embedded into a campaign of messages based on their behavior frame. And the idea is we're going to be a, an analyzing that information and looking at how it correlates to A1C levels and care-seeking behavior and all of that. Um, so that, those results aren't public yet, but those are the types of things that we're, we're working on. Yeah, it's really cool that all of this comes down to a text and you're able to make that type of change and measure those results. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's really, yeah, it's really simple stuff, right? And that's what we find. It's not, the text itself is just a simple vehicle for all the rest. Yeah, it's really cool. And You shared a little bit about your experience in Ghana and how that framed sort of how you look at healthcare and how you looked at developing this solution to improve healthcare access. What lessons have you learned from your work globally that really relate back to the U.S. healthcare system or something perhaps that we could learn how to do better as a result of what you've seen globally? Right. So I think that um, one of the things we observe globally is that, you know, and the commonality is that everyone's trying to achieve the same things at the end of the day. So everyone's trying to improve access, you know, improve quality, manage costs. Like those things are universal in healthcare, no matter where, where you are. And ultimately it's, it's about the, the patient experience and outcomes. So, knowing that everyone is starting from the same place, but the context vary, you know, the, the other thing that we see as universal is, is mobile. And what part of what you find in, in emerging market settings is that there's no legacy technology. There's no legacy systems yet because those environments are moving from paper to electronic, but in a scenario where, you know, people talk about leapfrogging, but where they don't have to be tied to, decades of legacy technology and infrastructure, which can make it very hard to move the needle and to make certain types of shifts from an innovation perspective. So when you're in the emerging market setting, you can kind of start in a greenfield context. So work we're doing in places like Kenya and South Africa, we're in environments where people are going from paper to electronic now. 
So there's no Epic or Cerner. There's no embedded IT systems that force us to have to do certain things. And that completely shifts how you look at the digital problem and what's possible. Now, the challenge of that is you have to do a lot of the heavy lift of transitioning from paper to electronic, which you wouldn't necessarily experience in a more mature market. So that is kind of the trade-off. And so we're able to take lessons learned from how do you just go from a paper-based scenario to a digital scenario in a mobile-first context, right? And we can work on those things in, let's say, African countries so that when we're coming here to the U.S., it gives us a little bit of an out-of-the-box view where we're not necessarily starting from the point of all the constraints, but what's possible. And so you just, you know, we, we come at the problem from a different angle. And I think that probably leads us to solutions that are, you know, on the one hand, when you work in emerging markets, you have to be simple and low tech. You know, we're not taking anybody to Mars. That's not our business, right? So it has to be simple and low tech in African countries. And I think people want simple and low tech here. They want convenience. They don't need something fancier that they don't understand how to use. Right. And they just want the result. Yeah. Right. I agree. I agree with that. And, you know, I think as hospital leaders are looking at how they can respond to disruption or be innovative, I think the immediate thought is to go to some of those high tech solutions. You know, there's a lot of conversation around artificial intelligence or precision medicine. But I think one of the things we've been trying to discuss more and have more conversation around are those low tech innovations that we're going to need regardless of where we go with technology. And I think Access Mobile is a really great example of a low tech innovation that can really help patients and communities. So is there anything else you have, you know, from your experiences in developing this low tech solution that you think hospital leaders around the country could learn from as they are seeking to be innovative and develop new solutions? Right. So one thing is to say that, you know, certain aspects of what we do require like significant and deep expertise, right? So the work we do around like data analytics, population health, behavioral science, that's where a lot of the, I think, exciting opportunity is, right? Because technology is just a vehicle. So if you start with the problem and we want to drive behavior to achieve a certain outcome, a lot of the heavy lift is figuring out that behavior change element. That's like the holy grail that everyone's trying to get to, right? And so what we're doing is that part is where we bring in expertise data analytics, all those things. Mm -hmm. But then when it comes to the beneficiary or the end user, they want the path of least resistance, right? So the issue is where are we building the sophistication, right? So it's like the sophistication should be in understanding behavioral frames and what type of content people are most responsive to to drive behavior. And we should be investing time and effort there. And with most of our clients, that's where they first bring us in on a, more of an expertise and services side to like do that hard work. But then when it comes to the tech, like you said really well, Priya, it's not necessarily about all this AI driven machine learning driven stuff. It's about the simple things. So that's how we try to blend that mix of best practice, evidence, data with path of least resistance for the end user. And I think if health systems kind of take that approach, it, they'll make maybe slightly different choices about how they think about technology and what they want to bring into the fold and their criteria. So I think that's something we've learned, at least with the, the clients we work with now, it seems to be where we can maximize value. And so we don't want to be a group that just says, we believe our tech is going to solve your whole problem. There's too much there's too much complexity in healthcare. It has to be a mix of both. I definitely agree with that. So before we wrap up, uh, just one last question. A lot of the conversation we've had through the Value Initiative has been around how hospitals can partner with others, whether that's companies like yours that are developing low-tech innovative solutions, whether it's community stakeholders, whether it's payers. 
Um, so what are your thoughts on how hospitals can better partner with other stakeholders to really improve value for patients and communities? Yeah, well, that's a good point. I mean, I think um, one thing that comes to mind about why partnerships are key is that at the end of the day, all of this costs, it, it requires resources. And particularly for situations where hospitals are in, they're, they're operating with, let's say, thin margins, you know, or they have margins that don't allow them to have huge innovation budgets. It could be very hard to like, for them to take some of the risks required to get to this innovation. And so to me, what that means is that to the extent that health systems and hospitals can partner to share resources around innovation process where there's win-wins will probably help balance the issue of risk and resources available for innovation, right? So that it becomes a shared load. And I think that's one thing that's going to be critical, particularly in the rural context as well, where you have lots of isolated facilities in an area that are trying to do something like this, um, that resource pooling may even become more critical, but I think it's relevant for everybody. Yeah, that's a really great point and a great differentiation for our rural communities. Thank you, KP, for being with us today. We appreciate your time and your insights and sharing a little bit of your journey with Access Mobile and how you are working to improve value in communities. Thanks so much for the opportunity to share our, our, our work and our story. Thanks, and have a great day. All right, you too.